Professor Ina Wagner, Vice Dean, Faculty of Science, Professor Patrick Ndungu, the inductee, Professor Mugera Gitari, our respondent, School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Venda, senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, distinguished guests, and particularly the family. Uh, I know that uh, Professor Ndungu's sister, Lucy Ndungu, is here, so welcome to you. I don't see where you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> welcome. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Sani Bonani, Khoenand, good evening, Tobela. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to this professorial inaugural lecture of Professor Ndungu. As I do so, I wish to express once again a warm welcome to his loved ones, special guests, and his colleagues. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the Vice Chancellor and deliver their inaugural addresses. I'm acting on Professor Marwala's behalf. This ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. We therefore gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Ndungu to, this il to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors provide a university with its identity, character and academic legitimacy and integrity. We will, uh, once we have listened to the inaugural address, there is a gown which denotes the professorship which will be formally assumed. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Ndungu as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address in which and in, is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates with society. It sounds out as a moment of pride for the incumbent, his family, those that have joined through the, this uh, live stream, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university referred to the whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have, have been viewed as instrumentalist, serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward Said, in, in an article on defiance and taking positions offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual. As one who commands a vast knowledge of his her, or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step into, a pub, into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it. To step out of the boundaries of the academic, to connect to oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. 
the intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be, a, to be flagship carriers of our discipline? Now, you know when you're at the University of Johannesburg, when you hear the word disrupt, you also think of the fourth industrial revolution. And I know that nanotechnology and nanoscience is one of those areas and is certainly not nano at all when it comes to the fourth industrial revolution. This evening, as we will listen to Professor Ndungu as one further step in the journey of being a professor, this is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in this discipline. Let me now invite the Vice Dean, Professor Ina Wachner, to introduce Professor Ndungu. Yale Bocha, Bayadanki, Sia Bonga, I thank you. Prof. Sina, thank you. Prof. Kitari, Prof. Ndungu and guest, good evening. Patrick Ndungu was born in Nairobi, Kenya. He attended primary and secondary school in Nairobi and then pursued his first degrees in chemistry and biology at the University of Tennessee at St. Martin in the USA. After graduating cum laude, he then moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the USA to pursue his postgraduate studies. It was during this time in Philadelphia that the research bug bit Patrick. Through late nights, pub walks, when things stalled and supervising summer interns on many projects. In late 2003, he presented and then after an enlightening and rigorous six hour question and answer session, he successfully defended his thesis titled The Use of Bipolar Electrochemistry in Nanoscience contact-free methods for the site selection modification of nanostructured carbon materials. Patrick then graduated from the Drexel University in 2004 with a PhD in chemistry. In 2005, Patrick moved to Cape Town, South Africa to start his first postdoctoral adventure with Professor Linkoff and Dr. Nechaev. During that time, he gained some first-hand knowledge on hydrogen energy research and met some interesting characters that highlighted South African hospitality and a place called Mazzoli's. In 2008, Patrick began a second postdoctoral fellowship with Professor Leslie Petrick in the Environmental Nanoscience in Water Research Group. And it is there that he got his first taste of water research managing research projects and how to grow a research family. In 2010, Patrick moved to Durban when he took up his first permanent academic position as a lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. With the experiences and lessons he learned in Cape Town, Patrick continued to pursue research in energy and water and learn how to balance teaching and research. In 2015, with a heavy heart, but with a glint in his eye, he moved to the University of Johannesburg to take up a post as an associate professor. Currently, as a newly minted professor with many more years left in the academia, Patrick has authored and co-authored just over 100 peer-reviewed outputs in journals, books, and reports. He has guided 16 M and 10 doctoral candidates to successful completion and hosted two postdoctoral fellows. During this time, he has attracted a modest 4 million rand in external and internal funding through the NRF, WRC, ESCOM, TSP, Ungeni Water and the Universities of KwaZulu-Natal and Johannesburg. He is an editorial board member for Water SA, 
and a scientific editor in nanotechnology for the South African Journal of Chemistry and a C2-rated NRF scientist. One day, when he retires, he hopes to have a farm with a barn where strange noises, lights, devices, and smells will emanate and waft down a pristine valley, and neighbors will mutter under their breath, who led that dude into our neighborhood? Good evening. Colleagues, friends, distinguished guests, welcome. I'm going to try and give a little bit of highlight about what got me here. So hopefully this title will capture what uh, I've been doing for the past 10, 15 years, and why UJ was kind enough to give me this title of a professor. So to get everybody on the same page, I thought, and please bear with me, that I would start by talking about nano. Sometimes I find it very useful to just talk about basics. Um, some people hate lecturing first years. I love lecturing first years because it forces you to rethink the basics. It forces you to think about what am I really trying to teach these first years? And how am I trying to actually get that spark and hopefully poach them into my research group in four or five years. <laughs> so, basics. I know some of you, this is, this is old hand. This is what you know. When we talk about nano, we talk about scale. And what's so important about scale? So first, let's envisage what's going on when we're talking about scale in nano. So nano is 10 to the minus 9, or a billionth of a meter. And that's very hard to comprehend. It's very hard to grasp what are we actually talking about. So uh, some, like most lecturers, I steal internet pictures and put them up on my slides to try and you know <laughs> highlight these things. So the first one there is just showing you, OK, DNA strand. Everybody knows what it, or well, most of us have come across some idea what a DNA strand is in the popular media or uh, on TV. And if you multiply that by a thousand you get your average size of bacteria if you multiply that again by a thousand you get your raindrop so that means when we're talking about nano we're talking about a very 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 small uh, structure again the other popular way to to try and think about nano is look at uh, what does a single walled nanotube look like now why do why is this up there is because in nano, it's one of, it used to be or still is one of the bedrocks of research in uh, nanotechnology. Everybody likes using these materials. And in fact, there was, uh, there was something that popped up on my Twitter feed. MIT have figured out how to make a transistor or a computer chip, sorry, not a transistor, a computer chip just using carbon nanotubes, which is a first, apparently. But you multiply that by 100,000, you get to your usual human hair which I have none, but if you, <laughs> if you were to take your strand of hair and look at it and think about it, cut it up 100,000 times, that's what we're talking about when we're getting to the nano. And then if you go up 100,000, uh, you're talking about a 10 meter wide house, but those are small houses, I guess. But the one I like is the one when I look at the nanoparticles, uh, these were gold nanoparticles, these are about four nanometers. And to get an idea about how small they are, you've got to times that by a million to get your usual sugar ant. I hope that's a picture of a sugar ant. Or uh, in the context of something that's familiar to most of us in South Africa, times that again by a million, you get to about four laps around Soccer City. So nano is extremely small. And Things change when we're looking at the nanoscale. A lot of things change when we're looking at the nanoscale. So the excitement is everything changes at the nano. So I want you to keep that in mind. Everything changes at the nano. What do I mean or what do I want you to keep in your head? Familiar gold bar. We all wish we had a trunk full of gold bars under our bed. Nice, shiny yellow. 
get it to the nanoscale, it's red. So it's changed its color. Why has it changed its color? Its properties have changed. <clears throat> and one of the interesting things about uh, this red color is uh, for a thousand years, for thousands of years, people were actually putting gold in stained glass in uh, this historical Greek, Greek Roma, uh, Roman cup. They were mixing it. They didn't know what was going on, but they just knew if they mixed it, they get this brilliant color when you put a candle in there, that red color. And that comes from these properties we see at the nanoscale. So things change when we get down to the nano. Sorry. Um, the fundamental properties change. Uh, your magnetic properties, uh, the way things interact with light, the way things interact with electricity, everything changes at the nano. Whether it's for the better or whether it's for the worse, that's debatable. But things change once we get down to the nano. Now, how did nanotechnology come around? It was kind of a debate on how or what this term nanotechnology and who coined the term nanotechnology, who came up with this concept of nanotechnology. But if you really go into it, everybody was doing something that was based on nano for hundreds of years. This fellow over here, Faraday, was back in the 1800s. He was making these uh, solutions of gold colloids. He was working with nano. But it's only in the 50s and 60s and the 80s when people started, let's put all these different concepts together and let's bring all this together and think about what is nanotechnology. So conceptually, we have a few key, uh, key things. We have uh, Freeman, Richard Freeman's talk. He talked about nanomachines, manipulating things atom by atom building things atom by atom. Drexler, he also talked about something similar, and engines of creation, where he's also talking about these machines that create little um, devices or build up structures. Kind of, if you're a sci-fi fi sci fiction fan, he's talking about nanobots. He was basically explaining nanobots in, uh, in the mid 80s. And he came up with this idea independent of the guy who actually first used the term. Um, uh, ta ta Taneguchi. He was talking about, he was actually doing macro, ma micro fabrication. He was making uh, computer chips and all kinds of stuff. And he thought, you know, eventually we're going to have to go from the micro and we're going to have to go to structures that are much smaller than micro. And he came up with this term nano. So conceptually, they're credited with bringing up this idea of nanotechnology. Let's bring all these concepts, these developments in science. And let's give them a nice, flashy term that everybody can relate to. Besides uh, the, the theoretical and conceptual ideas, there were some key developments in terms of experiments, development of materials. So in the history of nanotechnology, when they talk about experimental development, they talk about the scanning tunneling microscope. So this was a device where you could just start moving one atom at a time. And write out letters. Whether that's useful or not is up for history to decide. So that was one of the biggest breakthroughs back in 81. And then by the mid 80s when they become a little cheaper and more widely used, research using these systems kind of grew. Then came the discovery of fullerenes. These are soccer balls the size of about a one nanometer. This is carbon in a soccer ball about the size of one nanometer by um, Smalley and his team. They discovered Fullerenes, and they got a Nobel Prize for it, so it must have been a big discovery. And then eventually came I Ijima. And those of us in the nano field always see that his paper is always cited 2,000 times, 10,000 times, because he first described these carbon nanotubes. This is, again, carbon rolled up into a seamless cylinder on the nano scale. And then there were some other key developments. Our quantum dots, so those are are our nanostructures, little objects, about 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus nine nano, nanometers, sorry, 10 nanometers or lower. But the key thing is, with all of these discoveries, chemists had a big role to play. 
they're the ones who actually figured out how to make things a little bit more easier, how to start synthesizing these things. So when chemists say that we're the central science, this is why. This is why. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> we're the ones who did this. <laughs> if it wasn't for chemists, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. <laughs> So that's, it's a bit of hubris, I guess. Maybe the physicists and the mathematicians, they hate saying, hey, why do you guys keep calling yourselves the central science? Well, the physicists think of stuff. We make it. <laughs> we make it happen. <laughs> so the development of these materials, how to synthesize them, how to make them in a controlled manner, how to belt them up, that actually brought about a little bit of a boost in nano. Uh, the other big boost in nano, as with any research, is the money. The money was a very, very, very big boost to nano research. So around 2001 to 2004, when you look at the history of nano, billions was pumped into nano research. Obviously led by the Americans, where the Americans go, we seem to all follow, I don't know why, but they pumped in billions, they started this whole nanotechnology initiative, and everybody tried to catch up. So you had the Japanese, you had the Europeans, pumping billions into nano research. So it was a confluence of all these different things. The money was there, how to make these materials, and some of the instruments now to actually look at these materials so we know what's going on, brought about this whole boom in nano research. My research, or what I like to think is my research, or my research interests, is in water and energy, and it's mainly making nanomaterials and nanocomposites. So nanomaterials are making either nanotubes, I'm making either nanoparticles or I'm making nanowires. So as you can see, the, the theme there is call something, put nano in front of it, it's nano. So uh, nano balls, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, put it together, you make a nano composite. When you put these things together, uh, try to see if they're useful in water, energy, and strange phenomena. Why strange phenomena? It goes back to this whole idea. At the nanoscale, things are different. Things change. The properties are different. If the properties are different, we should be seeing unexpected things. We should be seeing strange things. That's the fun of research, right? If you, if you get an expected result, then why the hell were you doing it in the first place? You know, you need to get something unusual, something you can't explain. So when the student comes into the office and says, this is the result, but I don't know what it is, so I don't want to talk about it, and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's think about it. Let's sit down. Let's try and figure out, is this real? Is this strange? Is it new? Or maybe you forgot to take the water out, or maybe you forgot to add some salt here or there. But whatever the reason is, I like strange phenomena. I always like surprises in the lab. Well, the nice ones anyway. So <laughs> with water and energy, it's usually water treatment. Um, looking at emerging organic pollutants, so those are your, your, your drugs and other kinds of things that turn up in our water, fuel cells, uh, solar devices, energy storage, and things we haven't thought of yet. <clears throat> so where did this all begin? I have to put a map of where it all started. I like to do this simply because the Americans think we should all know where America is, but <laughs> it's not necessarily true. So I, was, I started my postgraduate uh, studies at Drexel University in Philadelphia on the East Coast. Uh, stole that picture from Google Maps. That is the actual chemistry building. I spent a lot of my time. <laughs> my supervisor, Professor Jean-Claude Bradley, unfortunately passed away in 2014. But I took a lot from him. He made me actually think outside the box. He pushed me to really, dis, uh, really think about uh, research in different ways. And one of the most, I think one of the key strengths uh, is how to mine the literature. It's not reading the literature, it's mining the literature. You don't just pick up a paper, one or two papers, no. I tell my students, if you're not reading 20 papers a week, you're wasting your time here. And they look at me like I'm mad. <laughs> Some of you might think I'm mad. How are you going to read 20 papers a week? That was one of the tests for before I was allowed to do my PhD. Read 20 papers in a week, and we'll test you on those 20 papers. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> That's nice. 
Somehow I managed. He also uh, instilled this thing of, let's, let's just look at research for the sake of research. Sometimes you'll come across some interesting stuff. So during those days, what were we doing? So nanostructures, uh, in those early days, how do you modify them? How do you put new structures on these nanostructures or anything? Well, these are kind of micro, almost nano. How do you modify them in an interesting way? How do we get them, uh, how do we get them to change their properties? And the way we were doing this was using electric fields. So we're using um, about four or five kilovolts. We're using organic solvents. We're using uh, graphite platelets at first. And we're just picking a model system, our palladium metal. And we're saying that if we use an electric field, we can actually put it on a specific point on a nanostructure, on a, a, a microstructure, these graphite platelets. So this early work, we managed to, uh, to modify graphite platelets. We were just trying to figure out, can we modify specific area? It's all about modifying that specific area. Eventually, fell into the nanospace. We started looking at these things called carbon nanotubes. Carbon nanotubes were, were or may be still the bedrock of nano research. If you ever go onto Google, or if you ever just search nano and you look for carbon nanotubes, there are tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of papers on carbon nanotubes. So back then, it was the in thing to do. Why, why, not, uh, why was everybody looking at these? Because theoretically, they were supposed to be extremely strong. They were supposed to be the material that would take us to the next generation of devices. They were the material that was supposed to herald this whole new era of uh, breakthroughs in health, computing, catalysis, you name it. If you did something with a nanotube, you probably got published, you probably got uh, recognition. It was, it was very popular back then. So we were just looking at, can we modify one side of the nanotube? Because it's easy to take these nanotubes and, well, Cook it, if you like, mix it with some solution, mix it with some kind of precursor, and you'll get structures all over the place. That's no control. There's no control there. So with this method, we're saying, OK, if we put in an electric field, we apply our electric field, we get a bit of control. We can put the structure, what we want, at the tip of the nanotube. I remember when I, when I first came up with this image, it was, I was, I was driving up to Lehigh University to do my electron microscopy. So that's about two hours away from, or an hour and a half away from uh, Philadelphia. And if you know electron microscopy, you recognize these are pictures where you, you sit at the instrument, you take 20 pictures and hope those 20 pictures are the pictures you need. And then you go develop the film yourself. And after you develop the film yourself, you go scan it. <laughs> And then you go to your supervisor and like, this is what I got. <laughs> Not in this day and age where, you know, everything is digital. So students just take 100 pictures, bring a disc, and that's it. Back then, there was a little bit of <laughs> sweat and tears when we're doing this. And he, he thought, you know, I don't know why you're bothering to do all this kind of stuff. And I was like, hey, look what happened. We can actually kind of control the growth. So that was a nice little result there. We could adjust the field time, adjust how we apply the field, and eventually get structures just on one side of an attitude. So dreaming back then, you know, in between reading articles, watching, I think Star Trek maybe, uh, and other sci-fi shows, Babylon 5, if, if anybody knows Babylon 5. <laughs> Dreaming about what would this lead to? Maybe with one side modified, we can start manipulating these nanotubes. But we never got that far. It's all about, let's just do the fundamental work. So from the commercial nanotubes, I started growing my own nanotubes. 
and then I started modifying those with other materials, so some polymers, some, uh, some other metals. And then eventually we showed why is it useful to modify one end? Well, if we put our nanotube in an environmental uh, scanning electron microscope, again, another machine you can use to look at nanostructures, turn up the pressure a little bit, get water to condense, we could actually control where the water condenses. We could actually control where the water fills the nanotube. It was a bit exciting for us. We're like, wow, we can actually fill these nanotubes with a liquid. We can actually put something in there. Water, okay, fine, it's not a big deal. But what about drugs? You could actually start now putting drugs in that, right? Maybe these could be used for drug delivery. So that was our speculation. It got us published, obviously. When you speculate these nice things, it gets you published. But that was some of the work we did. So <clears throat> eventually, um, as, as they say, you've got you to reflect about what you did. So when I look back at the work produced back then, got a few citations. The thesis itself. I was actually surprised people actually cited my thesis six times. I was like, wow, I actually wrote something that people like in my thesis. <laughs> if you've read any thesis, a PhD thesis, it's usually, you know, just <laughs> somehow you put something together and somebody agrees you should get a PhD. But no, there were six people out there that thought it was useful. The work itself got some moderate citations. And it actually <coughs> led, to, led to this kind of citation web, if you like, where this work other people took it forward into catalysis, sensors, Janus structures, so Janus being the two-faced Roman god, um, drug delivery, uh, nanofluidics, electrochemistry, magnetics. So the work did have a bit of influence. It did have a bit of impact. So that was nice to see, especially after some years. So those were the early days with my PhD. And eventually, I left uh, Philadelphia and moved to Cape Town. So Cape Town, South Africa, first postdoctoral fellowship. They offered me a postdoctoral fellowship because they thought I could grow nanotubes. That's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come and do a postdoc, you can grow nanotubes. So this is not what they had, but I walked into this lab and there's this weird contraption with 20, 30 knobs and devices and different heating elements. It was very, very complicated. And they're like, you've got to use this to make nanotubes. And I thought to myself, what kind of voodoo witchery is this to make nanotubes? <laughs> I was like, OK, fine. Being the Kenyan that I am, I smiled. I took it apart. And I built my own. Now, <laughs> I'm sure guys in the lab were like, this guy is going to be fired in six months. <laughs> because this system was designed by some German professor. <laughs> And they got some guys, some special technicians from Swage Lock. They flew them in and they built this whole complicated thing. And they're like, this is what you're going to use to make nanotubes. And I'm like, yeah, OK, fine. Nice, nice idea. <laughs> I took it apart and came up with a simple system to make nanotubes. And they were telling me, you have to order the speciality gas. Now, I'm just coming from America. And when you order something, you get it the next day. <laughs> now, in Cape Town, they're telling me you have to wait about four to six weeks before this gas gets here. I was like, really? <laughs> what am I supposed to do for four to six weeks? <laughs> Hence, I took it apart. I built something else. <laughs> and I just started digging around the lab. Like, okay, what do you have? What gases do you have? Oh, we have LPG for first year. Oh, okay, let me try that. Boom, made nanotubes. <laughs> they're like, what? What do you mean you made nanotubes? <laughs> I made nanotubes. <laughs> So this was the system I came up with. Eventually, we moved to ethylene because uh, LPG, it's a mixture of butane propane. So controlling your, your, your purity and products, not very, not very easy. Although, I think there are ways around that. I like to think there are ways around that. And I haven't told anybody there are ways around that. I have some nice ideas around that, but hey, I gave them this method. We grew nanotubes 
we grew uh, mesophorous cotton. They had this craze with hydrogen storage. They wanted to use nanotubes for hydrogen storage. So they had these uh, mish metals. That's just lanthanum with a bunch of other metals mixed in, some special kind of alloy. It's supposed to absorb hydrogen and it's supposed to release it and it's supposed to uh, be a way to store hydrogen so we can move it around safely, eventually put it in cars. But when you get down to it and looking at the weights and energy density and all these kind of fancy things, it doesn't make sense. But they had this stuff lying around. I used it and made some very beautiful nanotube structures. And yes, I did take hundreds of pictures. It's not just these two to show that I did get my nanotubes, I did get my graphitic structures, and they were, um, they were useful in a couple of applications. What kind of applications? So, it was hydrogen storage. Uh, they were interested in hydrogen storage. So, I took something that's known for hydrogen storage, I put my nanotubes on there, and we got some interesting results. We increased the capacity, just a little bit. Now, we used a bit of a controversial method for hydrogen storage but to test it, but it seemed to tell us what we wanted to, to see, so I was happy with that. Uh, they wanted to know how to electrolyze water, so that just means put a current through water, split water from its H2O to hydrogen and oxygen so we can make hydrogen from water. So we made these beautiful nanowire structures. I put my nanotubes on there, I grew my nanotubes on there and it seemed to work much better. So I was just putting nanotubes wherever I could in that lab. Just throwing them there, hey, let's try nanotubes here. Okay, let's try them. Boom, everything seemed to work. So it followed that kind of philosophy of the early days. If you use nanotubes in nano, everything just gets better, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> then uh, we had the visitor um, from Thailand. She was interested in working with a very dangerous hydrogen storage material, uh, lithium aluminum hybrid, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty dangerous. You breathe on it, it explodes. You look at it funny, it kind of starts to fire. <laughs> so I was like, no, we're not using that. We're going to use nanotubes. So she grew the nanotubes. I showed her how to grow the nanotubes. Um, I showed her how to boil the nanotubes with a, with a precursor. <laughs> boil. Mm -hmm. Uh, she got palladium on there. I, I joke that, you know, it's boiling, but it's actually very tricky to do this. It's actually very, very tricky. It's not very easy. It actually takes a few sleepless nights to get the right temperature, to get the right concentration, to get the right kind of solvent, to get this nice uh, distribution of palladium on your nanotubes. So she struggled for about six months to get just that one result. Then I was like, hey, try this method. And she was like, why didn't you tell me this before? <laughs> in, a, in a week, in less than a week, she got nanoparticles on nanotubes. I was like, well, you know, I just thought it would be good training. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she, she left happy, I think. <laughs> and we, we eventually tested these for hydrogen storage. So, I said carbon nanotubes, everybody wants to use carbon nanotubes in everything. Hydrogen storage, they were the in thing back then. They were supposed to be the miracle material that gets us hydrogen energy. Hydrogen energy being that clean form of energy. Why is hydrogen energy a clean form of energy? If you burn hydrogen, you get water. That's all you get. You know if you burn your petrol, you get all kinds of nasty things coming out of your exhaust pipe. Uh, carbon dioxide, soot. Uh, nitrogen oxides, things that cause asthma and all kinds of uh, health problems. But if we're just burning hydrogen, just get clean energy. If you're using hydrogen uh, for various processes, it should be more efficient. So everybody was interested in getting the right kind of storage material going, and nanotubes was supposed to be that thing. We tried it out, we got some interesting results, not quite there. So these numbers just tell you, yes, you've got some hydrogen storage. These beautiful graphs tell you, yes, you've got uh, a little bit of hydrogen there, but not enough 
to write home about. That's what I thought. But everybody else, no. <laughs> that was one of the most cited papers uh, from, from that lab uh, when I was there, when, when I was involved. In. It generated some excitement, and it still does. So this work was a little bit more focused. Um, it didn't generate as much of a interest and citation buzz as my PhD work, but it did generate a buzz. Easy way to make nanotubes, how to store hydrogen. And for me, it was, I learned how to build devices, scrutinize data, and I could make nanotubes out of anything. And an easy way to deposit nanoparticles. Impact-wise, a couple of postgraduate students uh, got them MSCs, so that was nice. Uh, I was happy about that. Contributed to their projects, and they and they graduated, um, and moved on. Cape Town Part Two. I don't know if anybody can recognize the respondent there. <laughs> so started my second postdoctoral with uh, Professor Leslie Petra, and that's where. I started working with water, water research. The interest in water research. That's when I found out there's a bigger world than energy. There's more than energy, there's water. We started some water research. We looked at acid mine drainage, so that's your extremely acidic polluted water. Uh, we looked at how to um, treat water using photocatalysis. South Africa is one of the biggest producers of platinum group metals. Till Zimbabwe gets its act together, and they can actually start mining platinum group metals in Zimbabwe again. Um, because when you look at the geology, there's actually quite a bit up in Zimbabwe. But for now, South Africa is the leader in platinum group metals. So the idea is, how do we beneficiate them? How do we stop selling the rocks out there and having people sell us the fine chemicals? How do we start making the right products? So there was a nano project involved in the whole uh, beneficiation of platinum. So uh, photocatalysis, I might have dropped a hint that we started working on photocatalysis then. So again, just a little bit of science, please bear with me. So photocatalysis, what, what are we doing? We're, we're taking uh, a catalyst particle, we're hitting it with light, it interacts with that light. After interacting with that light, we get some active species generated eventually. And those active species is what goes ahead and destroys what we're trying to get out of the water. If it works perfectly in a perfect world, your pollutant, your organic pollutant, goes to H2O and CO2, some benign products. If it works perfectly. <clears throat> so we started. Uh, playing around with this thing again, getting our nanotubes, growing our nanotubes, modifying our nanotubes, and trying to see if we could get some catalysis going. And this is when we got our first strange result. Carbon nanotubes are supposed to be very active. <coughs> Carbon nanotubes, they're not actually supposed to be photocatalytic. They're not supposed to interact with light and then something happens. So we got that result. We actually tried it out. We put our nanotubes in this system and we're like, wait a minute, nothing's supposed to be happening here, but something's happening. What's going on? That was our first strange result. When we put a metal on these systems, it's supposed to improve the photocatalytic property. But so if you put one metal, OK. That's good. Let's compare it to a second metal. That's good. If we put both together, it should be working much better. No, that's not what happened. It actually worked worse. That was another strange result. Uh, we, we, we told a story what we thought was going on. Uh, we looked at some theoretical papers that some physicists had drawn up and said, yeah, we've proven what they did. That's why we got this strange result. We then went on to making um, nanotubes for fuel cell devices. So fuel cell devices are those devices where we take our hydrogen, our oxygen, and we get some electricity out of there. We put these together. Again, 
using this simple idea of just mixing our nanotubes with our precursors, putting it into this reactor, uh, applying a vacuum, heating it up, and getting these nanostructures. And we got some really nice nanostructures this time around. We were working with somebody out of Oxford University. They had a very fancy uh, electron microscope. We didn't have anything comparable at that time. And what they found is when we did this method, we were actually getting these clusters. We were actually going below the nano size. We were going below one nanometer on these nanotubes. And we thought that's why these things were very active when we tested them. It's because this method was producing these nanoparticles and it was producing these clusters that were below that nanometer range. Really active material. Then there's some early late late work with AMD. I call it early late late work because the project ended in 2012 but the paper came out this year. <laughs> so there's the late late part. <laughs> <laughs> so we took this nanoparticle, um, iron oxide. So the iron oxide, that's your, your just think of an iron nail um, reacting with oxygen, giving you your iron oxide on the outside. Then you have your pure iron in the, in the middle. Because you have this, uh, this, this dual structure, it's able to um, react with various other pollutants in water. We threw it into this acid mine drainage. Acid mine drainage being this ugly water um, you see in various parts around the world. Not only in South Africa, China has a problem with acid mine drainage. Uh, the United States has a problem with acid mine drainage. South America has a problem with acid mine drainage. It's, it's usually abandoned mines. Rain gets into the abandoned mines. You get some nice chemistry going on when the water comes out. It's at an ugly pH, that's at pH 1. So that means if you go swimming, you won't, you won't only lose your clothes, you'll probably lose your skin, your teeth, and your eyes, and everything else. And because it's such a low pH, it also carries all these metals. And all these metals are toxic. So we treated our AMD, or sorry, we treated some AMD samples with this, and we found that we were actually removing about 90 to 98 percent of the heavy metals. We're getting rid of the sulfates. The trick with uh, treating AMD these days is how to get rid of the sulfates. That's a very, very big problem. We've got about 40 to 60 percent. But the interesting thing for me was because you have this water sample and it has a lot of metals, and one of the big amounts of metals is iron, you can make your nanoparticles using this pollutant. So using this pollutant, I make my nanoparticles, I take those nanoparticles, and then I treat AMD again, and it works. Why? I don't know, but it works. So I'm, treating, I'm, I'm taking a pollutant that's useless, I'm using it to make something that's useful, and then I'm going again and treating a pollutant again. It's almost like I'm getting something out of nothing. <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. I don't know why it took so long to publish this work, but yay, <laughs> those, are the, those are the breaks. So that's the early, late, late work when we were trying to uh, treat AMD. So eventually I had to leave Cape Town, moved to Durban, uh, started as a, as a lowly lecturer in Durban, but it was fun. <clears throat> And now I was like, you know what? This energy thing, this water thing, it's kind of fun. Let's try, and, let's try and branch out. So we have this bright yellow ball in the sky we call the sun. It's free. Let's use it. Let's get some energy out of there. How do you do that? Let's look at solar cells. What's the easiest way to make solar cells? OK, give me a billion dollars. I can make a facility, and I can start making solar cells. But nobody's going to give me a billion dollars to start making silicon solar cells, what everybody sells. Oh, not a billion dollars. I think it's $100 million now, $10 million. So nobody's going to give you that kind of money. So let's look at other alternatives for solar cells. And the other alternatives out there were these organic solar cells, these dye-sensitized solar cells. These are much cheaper versions of solar cells. These are easier to, 
to produce. You don't have to have that big multi-million investment. You don't have to have your, I was gonna say Donald Trump. <laughs> you don't have to have your Bill Gates come and invest <laughs> in your idea. <laughs> you could probably do this in your garage. And the, and the interesting thing is, there was this PhD student from Kenya who actually did that. <laughs> he, he actually made disensitized solar cells in his garage. <laughs> And he couldn't figure out uh, how to make them last longer than two weeks. But I was like, yeah, good for you. You actually made them. <clears throat> so we started working on these kind of solar cells. So you have a dye. You have some material in there. Um, you have a bit of liquid in there. And you get a bit of current when you sun shine some light. Your organic solar cells, you take a polymer. You mix it together with the right kind of nanomaterials. You shine some light. You get, some material, you get your, your electricity out of that. Now, when we started this research, we were, we were trying to play with the big dogs. Big mistake. They were always talking about efficiency. If you want to publish, you must come with a new efficiency. You must come with a higher efficiency. If you want to get noticed, it must be world-class efficiency. Then a couple of years ago, I was at a conference presenting this, and somebody said, hey, dude, what about the current? I was like, you're right. We're actually getting good current out of these devices. Basic physics, voltage means I can do work. Current, I can do work. I can do something. I was like, why didn't we see this before? <laughs> Staring us right in the face. So these things were actually producing some decent amount of current. They were producing a decent amount of current, meaning they could actually do some decent amount of work. But that was only a few years later, after going to a conference. So I, I suppose I'm saying conferences are very useful. Academics just don't go on holidays. <laughs> just putting it out there. <laughs> With the polymer solar cells, same thing. We were getting some good currents. Our efficiencies weren't that great, but we were getting some good currents. And we were working with different kinds of nanotubes. At this point, when I got to UKZN, we were actually looking at how we could design our nanotubes. It was no longer, let's just throw in our gas and hope for the best. We were trying to think, how do we design these nanotubes? How do we actually get them to have a certain amount of nitrogen in them? How do we get them to have a certain amount of boron? How do we get this, this weird, or interesting structures with our nanotubes. And these were the ones we were putting into these, uh, to these devices. <clears throat> Eventually, I tried to build something again. Um, why did I try to build this? Um, I, I guess back home we call it Juakali. Um, my Zulu escapes me. Uh, <laughs> so many years in, in Durban. <laughs> Anyway, it's just a mishmash. You just put something together and hey, there it is. <laughs> like a roadside mechanic, if you like. So we put this device together. And the interesting thing about this is before we've been growing nanotubes at about 700 degrees C, which is pretty high temperature. Now we're growing them at about 150 degrees C. So now you can grow them at low temperature. You can start growing them on plastic substrates. You can start growing them on ordinary glass. And this was just something we put together, and we grew our nanotubes. And we got some very nice graphitic nanotubes. And when we put the device together, again, we got some high current there again. These devices were working. They shouldn't have worked, by the way, because you've got nanotubes, you've got nanoparticles, now you're putting this polymer in there. It should not have worked. If you go into the literature when they're making these kind of devices, they're in practically a clean room. They're making them in a clean room. They're, they're, they're depositing them layer by layer, slowly, very carefully. But hey, we're like, no, forget that. We're not going to invest tens of millions. We're just going to see what we come up with. And something worked. <coughs> so. It's only after this conference, this guy actually said, you know what, your devices actually have quite a bit of current in them. I actually sat down and looked. I was like, wait, 
if we actually looked at how to innovate, how to get our solar cells up to a size that's kind of practical, so the size of a piece of paper, we can actually start pushing out 8 watts. Okay, 8 watts doesn't sound like much, but in today's energy efficiency, that's an LED light bulb that lights up your room. Next time you're in Builder's Warehouse or Game, I dare you to go look at that LED bulb. Just see how, much, how many watts it takes. <laughs> they all have uh, pretty low power. If you get them up to a meter, so cover your window, you can start powering your microwaves and your LED TV. What else were we looking at over there? Uh, I started looking at our um, fuel cells again, but this time I was looking at solid oxide fuel cells. Uh, the reason I was looking at the solid oxide fuel cells is because of this whole thing about uh, fuel flexibility. I wanted to be able to um, have the ability to, to, to use any kind of fuel. We didn't get there yet, but that's why we started looking at these solid oxide fuel cells. And they're a little simpler to make. The problem with them is they usually run at about 1,000 degrees. So we tried to make them run at about 400 degrees C. So get them down to a lower temperature. So the question there was the research innovation cycle. How do we take our research into innovation with those solid oxide fuel cells? And that's what we um, were looking at. And these complicated graphs just tells you we got something that is actually useful out of these devices. The water, um, <clears throat> the water research, why does everybody look at the water research? Why is it such uh, an interesting aspect? If you see that little blue dot, um, if you go onto this website, that little blue dot tells you that's, that's all of the usable water we have on the planet. So it kind of puts into perspective, that's why we need to protect our water resources. If you like the numbers, they're right there. We have very, very little usable water. So everybody's trying to figure out how do we recycle, reuse, how do we clean it up, how do we protect our water? One of the things we, we started doing was uh, looking at these polymers that they use to treat water. This is what uh, the Higgins water plant. So they use this polymer to treat the water before they send it out to your taps. It cleans it up. The problem was they needed to know what were the low levels. So what we did was let's use gold. And we figured out we could actually get it much lower than what people needed. We could actually detect it much lower. So that was a nice little result. Uh, we did some basic, basic uh, research on the rivers in KZN. Uh, that's where we took the students out in the back of a, of a pickup, a bucky. Told them, go out there. If you find any alligators, run away. <laughs> um, get the water samples, and let's go look at them. This was a three-year project, uh, but we're still producing the papers out of there. We're still getting out understanding what is actually in the water in terms of the pollutants. Um, the photocatalysis, uh, continued some of the work with the photocatalysis. Eventually, we want to get to these systems where, eventually, I want to get to these systems where I can actually use them and scale up. Uh, there are a lot of options in terms of what elements you can use for photocatalysis. I focused on my titanium and combinations with titanium. And again, I used my buddy over here to make these materials. <clears throat> and eventually, we got some interesting results again. We got another strange result. When we were using this material, we got a strange result. It wasn't supposed to work better than nanotubes, but it did. <clears throat> and that was, that was an actually nice little surprise. <clears throat> then with the photocatalysis, uh, we tried to actually use it on real things we find in the water. We tried to get rid of pesticides. Unfortunately, we could only get it down to something else. So we don't know if that's benign or it's just as bad as what we started with. So it comes up with this question, is, photo is photocatalysis a dead end? Is photocatalysis useless? And I put a little thought cloud there. Ask me about the lost files. Asked me about the lost data. There was this lovely, hardworking, intelligent, honest student 
that went beyond and above the call of duty and found that they could actually take things like this to CO2 and water. Unfortunately, they didn't want to take it into a master's project. They went and got a nice job and I never saw them again. So those are the lost files. <laughs> uh, Joburg. <laughs> Hello, Johannesburg. <laughs> Sounds like a song. What did I start doing in Johannesburg? I grew this area of research. I tried to grow this area of research. I revisited the energy story. I tried to diversify into this whole idea of supercapacitors. Everybody wants to develop batteries, but I was like, let's try supercapacitors. Supercapacitors nowadays in your high performance sports cars, if you look in the news, if you look on Twitter, they're making supercapacitors. They're putting them into your high performance sports cars. They're putting them into these buses in China. They're using supercapacitors. So maybe that's the way to go. Let's forget about batteries. Let's forget about the lithium ion batteries that power your cell phone. Let's move to supercapacitors. Continued some research with fuel cells and hydrogen storage. And again, some more lost files. Some CO2 chemistry fell along the way, BTEC, honest students. Some work with thermoelectrics and solar cells fell along the way. So I leave you with this last slide. <laughs> the interplay of the research is within these different materials. Nanomaterials, different carbon nanomaterials, making different kind of nanocomposites, looking at different nano oxides, combining one, two, or three, four different combinations, seeing whether I can make some solar cells, whether I can use them uh, in various applications. And the question is, where next? I definitely want to keep looking for that strange. I definitely want to keep seeing that strange. Desalination, that's the big buzzword these days. Gas storage, we wanna, we wanna get rid of CO2, so maybe we should store it and, and do something with it later. AMD, I wanna revisit the story with AMD. Photocatalysis, I don't think it's a dead end. I think there's still some more there. These and solid oxide fuel cells, I still want to continue there. There's still a lot to be done there. So when I look back, I'm like, yes, all the stuff that I managed to do, there's still more to do, and there's still more I want to do. <clears throat> and with that, I must acknowledge the people who thought my research was worth the effort and gave me some money. Uh, UJ, UKZN, uh, the IPSA project, Ngeni Water, ESCOM, Water Research Commission, um, NRF. And of course, you, my audience, for being patient enough to listen to me and to listen to my story. And of course, all the past, present students who actually get this work done. Thank you. Professor Sinha Acting PC, Professor Ina Wagner, Executive Dean, Professor Dongo, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Demande Kwana. Greetings from Venda in the evening. <laughs> you say a food. Yes, uh, I'm honored to be here today in this uh, important location for Professor Dongo and the university at lunch. I've had the privilege of knowing Dongo for quite some time, but as an academic, I've known him for like nine years, seven years. We started in uh, Western Cape, where we are both doing postdoc. So I can really attest to his journey to this, up to this point. And on a lighter note, I'm glad to be here in this induction occasion for Professor Dungu, who I consider to be a young professor. Why I'm saying this on a right note is that where I'm coming from during my master's, I was meant to believe that 
You want to become a professor when you have gray hairs <laughs> and at the age of 60 years. So when I landed in South Africa, I really wanted to prove that long. And I think I have, I have done that, and I see, I'm happy that Prof. Dongo is proving that theory long. And we have a young professor here who has so many years to a lot of stuff that he's hypothesizing to do. Now, when I was invited to be a respondent in this, uh, in this uh, occasion, uh, this thing sent me thinking and wanted to ask myself, who is really a professor? When we talk about a professor, what do we mean? And I got to look at this article by a guy called Mark Falan, Blues Mark Falan. He tells us, or he, he forces us to think of who a professor is. And I'm just going to mention the responsibilities that a professor is supposed to mentor. He's a guardian of academic standards and associated values. He's the enabler of a colleague scholarship and ambassador for the university. So now, when uh, I think uh, in my short belief comment or res response on uh, Professor Dungu's uh, presentation, is I'm going to try to engage very briefly on, based on those facts that I've, I've just given you. So now, if I look at the broader concepts, broader concept in today in terms of science, we are talking about this broader concept of sustainability, circular economy. We are talking about conservation of natural resources. And there is a generally a paradigm change towards that. We are not doing science just for the sake of doing the science in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in academics. We want, it, we want science to work for humanity. And we want to better the humanity with our science. And scientists today are under immense pressure that they have to develop, they have to convert the academic work from the lab into the field where it works for the people. And when I look at what uh, Professor Dongo career path up to this point, we can, we can see is engagement, engagement with science and try to put it out there to work for the community, to make the science work for the world, to make, to make it a, a better a better, a better place. And in this, we can see in his um, fields that he has tackled sustainable, we can see sustainable na nanoengineering. We can see water treatment, where he's, he's, he's bring in his nano science, nanoengineering, to try and bring a system that can treat water at that level. We have seen his work on carbon dioxide storage systems, energy storage system, fuel cells, uh, generation of clean fuel and clean water. And we can see uh, this is uh, water energy nexus, nanotechnology talks to all these fields and as uh, a serious application aspect. And we, we again look at his uh, work, this, the, the work that he did in Durban on uh, environmental monitoring, again we see we see the application, the application of knowledge in terms, in terms of trying to solve, again, uh, problems out there. And we can see how they applied their knowledge on gold nanoparticles to try and develop uh, an analytical method to detect very low concentration of this polymer that is used in wastewater treatment. And you can, you can attest to that today. We have so many, so many uh, materials that we are using today that are being released in the environment that we are not able to detect at that lower levels. And we know at that lower levels, that's when, again, those, the, those this agent have some uh, toxicological effects on the system, on the ecosystem. Um, to continue ahead, again, we see in, in conclusion, uh, in conclusion that the Professor Dong hypothesizes on the things that he wants to do in the future, the continuation of, uh, of, of his work. And we can see that the, the, uh, the kind of thing that he's hypothesizing to do, that uh, the, as, uh, as we discuss with him also in there informally, that he tells me that his research has just started. 
And we can attest to that. I see him hypothesizing on development of advanced materials for energy storage, hydrogen storage, aqua fuel cells, and again, we are seeing him going into transparent solar, diasensitized cells, all systems, and again, we see uh, a movement of Professor Dongo's work through these, uh, through these uh, years that he is trying to move from the lab, bench scale, to application, to prototyping. And today, that is a direction. There is a serious paradigm change, a lot of pressure that don't remain in the lab with your work. Prototype that work towards commercialization, because that's what we want to do. Remember, we're talking about converting this uh, knowledge system into a knowledge-based economy. And we can attest to that, that he has put forward hypothesis that drives his work uh, to, to that direction. With those short comments, brief comments, I can only wish Professor Dungo well in his career, and I thank you a lot. So please join your, uh, join your hands in uh, applauding also our respondent, Professor Guitari. We will be congratulating Professor Ndungu just uh, after that. Uh, let's give Professor Guitari a round of applause. And uh, let's give another very big round of applause to Professor Ndungu for his fantastic presentation this afternoon. This evening. And I would say that it was no small presentation, excuse the nano pun. I know this, is, this was for the chemists among you and the physicists uh, and the minority among uh, you who might have engineering type uh, blood like myself. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Ndungu to join, uh, to be in the front where we will be gowning uh, you. Um, and I'd also like to invite Professor Ina Wachner to join me in support. So congratulations. <laughs> and we're also just doing an image. Thanks. So Professor Ndungu will be waiting for you outside and he will have his cap as well. <laughs> <laughs> 